that we're lucky to have one of, um, I guess we could say, the, a famous person from computer security. Drew Dean is, is a famous person because his name has been in um, the media uh, as uh, having done bad things to bad software. Um, he has, is famous for uh, having uh, done things to the Java virtual machine environment. He's famous for having been involved in um, various attacks on digital rights management software. Uh, but he's also famous for being a good computer security expert. And today he's going to talk to us about deconstructing trust management. As you know, this problem of trust management is um, really difficult. Uh, you're talking about key infrastructures uh, where at some place in the system you need something that you can really trust. And so we're going to see what his research is leading him to in this area. Drew has uh, been uh, at uh, Princeton University where he received his uh, PhD. Uh, he was at Xerox Park until recently. And at this time, he's a scientist at uh, SRI International. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, so this is joint work with Ajay Chander and John Mitchell. And to the students in the room, well, I'm going to let you in on a little dirty secret. Tim invited me to come speak in July. And I said, ah, oh, yeah, September sounds good on the theory that this was all going to be done. Well, it's not quite. This is actually going to be a work in progress talk. So I have to apologize. So, so you'll see the dirty secret of how research actually gets done. Uh, it, it's not quite as clean as your faculty may make you think. So this, we broke things down in the two big areas. So I'm part of, as I said, this was joint work with Ajay Chander, who's my intern at SRI this summer, and John Mitchell at Stanford. We had a paper in the Computer Security Foundation's workshop that's going to be the first half of the talk, and then what we're currently working on um, is the second. So one of the Access control has been this fundamental problem. And when trust management came out, there was this DIMAX workshop um, in New Jersey that Joan Feigenbaum and some other people organized. And Butler Lampson sort of piped up in a way that only Butler can do. Isn't this what we called access control 20 years ago? Um, and in a lot of ways, it is, right? The fundamental problem here is can the subject access this object, right? And there are numerous examples. Can I get money from an ATM? Um, can a process access a memory location or maybe the more computer security relevant ones. So there have been a bunch of frameworks for doing this. Access control lists and capabilities are two very traditional ones. And then you had trust management getting introduced in 1996 uh, as sort of the newfangled version. So one of the things we want to do is understand the differences among these systems in a formal rigorous sense. Um, to understand what's new. So we were talking about access control mechanisms. We'll go through some history here. I'll present a formal model of access control mechanisms um, and the comparisons among them. And then something that you see in the distributed system sense, very much influenced by Sudsy and Spooky work, are these linked local names, these hierarchical name spaces that you get. There's been a lot of work on that, and we're doing sort of our own take. So this is all, in some ways, a, a highly personal take. This is not going to be very keynote-like. So, so this is going to be sort of a different view of that space. So access controlist ACLs, as we all call them, um, are really sort of simple, right? An object contains a list of, attached to an object is the list of who can access it. Um, so you go authenticate the subject and then just look in the ACL and see if that subject is given that right. Permission bits in Unix are a cut down form of ACL, right? ACLs usually have finer granularity where you can say on a truly per user basis, whereas in Unix you only have user group and other. But if you just if you look at it the right way, that it is a very limited form of ACL, right? It's saying if you're the owner of the file, you can you have these permissions. If you're in the group who owns the file, you have these permissions, and everybody else. Um, but conceptually, it's all the same thing. So ACLs, 
have one of the real features of Apple's is that they're ex it's extremely easy to revoke rights for a user, right? If you don't want somebody to have access to the file anymore, you simply take them off the Apple and the problem solved. Um, there are some scaling problems that, you know, the, the list is at the object and so apples and large systems can get really big and complicated and hairy and, and then you just have a general sort of mess. And lastly, of course, apples are evaluated when you're actually making an access to the file. In Unix, it's actually opening, right, when, when reads don't check things once, but uh, the access controls are checked at open time. So. Another popular model is sort of capabilities as tickets or un, you know, un, these unforgeable pointer sorts of capabilities. So subject and object don't really mean anything. Capabilities, one of these standard analogies is they're like the keys on your key ring. As far as, you know, as far as my, the front door of my house is concerned, anyone who possesses this key is authorized to, to get through the lock, right? No biometrics, you know, no fingerprint scanning being done, no weight sensor under the doormat, the, the CFI me. If anyone who holds this key is duly authorized. Um, so you, you have, so the subject presents a capability, the object checks the validity of the capability, you know, is it a capability for this object? Some systems you'll see freshness checking. And the entire decision, and of course, the word capability, just like the words trust management, is a highly overloaded term. Um, but for what I want to talk about here today, access, the access decision is solely a function of whether or not that capability is valid to do that thing, to perform that option, that action on that object. Um, examples of cap we've seen operating systems, Eros, uh, Amoeba, a few others. Um, Actually, it's a long list, but uh, those are probably two, those are two of certainly the more recent capability systems. Um, revocation in capabilities is very hard. Conceptually, if access is based on possession, in order to revoke, conceptually, you have to do this global search and go find all the capabilities. And particularly in a distributed system where some nodes are down, that can be an extremely difficult problem. People, you know, pe people have engineered ways around this starting with Dave Riddell's thesis 27, 28 years ago. Um, but again, access checking is easy. Um, and things get done more eagerly, right? When you're given the capability, not when you, uh, you, you need to control things as well as when they're, when they're accessed. So trust management uh, started with paper by Matt Blaze, Joan Feigenbaum, and Jack Lacey at the Oakland Conference in 96. Um, one of the big moves here is to, to be clear in the fact that this is a decentralized distributed system that we're talking about. Um, objects can locally delegate rights to other people, right? It, 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 in the real world, delegation is very important. And you may have a chain of delegations justifying why you should be given access to this object. Uh, so these chains are, as, as usual, digitally signed certificates. Um, so, you know, the the company has said Alice is a buyer. Alice goes off um, and makes a purchase um, with with the whole chain of certificates she has that justifies you know why this purchase should be allowed. Um, and so again, there, there's a lot of the real emphasis here is on the fact that you're in a distributed system on the fact that your authorization functions are really directly being based on cryptographic primitives, right? Which is something that you didn't really see with Apple's and capabilities. Capabilities you could implement in terms of cryptography, but it was not fundamentally built in to the model that you have a chain of delegation certificates that are being digitally signed. Um, and you can handle delegation policy matters locally here. There's no one binding authority. 
So the question becomes if apples and capabilities are sort of two ends of a spectrum, where does this fit in and is it better or worse or is it something entirely different in its own right? So roles of the first part of this were to specify and compare these mechanisms all in a common framework so to make the comparison easy. Um, to settle a lot of folklore in the field that apples and capabilities are not the same. Um, and ha how do we handle formalizing that this uh, fact that revocation is, can be quite difficult for capabilities. Um, and then to understand for, for this part of the talk, stripping away everything having to do with naming, just to understand the authorization mechanisms uh, that are going on here. And um, as I said, do, do this all in one framework so that we can compare things and understand the values and the costs of the different trade-offs that we make. So the access matrix was sort of one of the first real formal models. Yeah. <laughs> in the beginning, there was Lampson, as, as is the case in so much of the systems area of computer science. Um, I mean, this is obvious, right? You know, user one can read file one, user two can read and write file two. The, the obvious interpretation, and that turns out to be a fairly useful model. Um, other models, a um, famous paper by Harrison Rizon Ullman in 1976, building on the access matrix that you just saw, a bunch of, a set of actions creating and deleting subjects and objects, uh, adding somebody to a matrix entry and, uh, or adding a write to a matrix entry and deleting a write to a matrix entry and then some guarded commands built around those actions guarded by predicates on the current state of the matrix. And this result that if you start with some given matrix and you have some arbitrary set of commands, whether some write propagates to a given matrix entry is undecidable, alas. Um, the take plant model by Lipton and Snyder was an effort to get us a model that was decidable. We've seen wall based access control in the last decade and there are too many other systems to mention. Uh, Really though, the access matrix has been the dominant model in systems that get used today, particularly with discretionary access. Sorry, I should also preface this being the Naval Postgraduate School, that I'm talking about discretionary access control here. Mandatory access control is outside the scope of this work. Um, but really for discretionary systems, the, the access matrix has been the dominant model that just about everything. So, the observation is that this matrix is usually quite sparse. As you see here, it's e even vaguely sparse. In the real world, th these are highly sparse, so you want an efficient way of storing this thing. It would be highly inefficient to, to store all these empty elements. So the ACL is just a column out of this matrix, right? Attached to file two, user one can read it, user two can read and write it, and nobody else gets to do anything. So it's a very handy, uh, way and it tells us that apples and matrices are fundamentally the same because you just put all the apples together and you reconstruct the entire matrix. Um, now there are two views of capabilities. I sort of talked about the capabilities as unforgeable tickets as references before. Another model is to say that well, a capability is in some way just a row of this matrix. Um, this is in Tannenbaum's operating system book among other places. You'll, you'll see this. Um, and again, that's just the, it's storing it by rows, storing it by user one. Once we've authenticated it's user one, he can read file one and he can write file two and can't do anything on file three. It turns out that this view and the unforgeable reference view are different. And we'll see that later, but one of the big results, or one of the things we wanted to try and do was really pin down what exactly is the difference here. Um, you got an answer. So, folk theorem. Capabilities and access control lists are equivalent. You know, uh, you know, everybody knows this, but 
it's awful hard to actually find the proof. Um, so moving from moving over into trust management, the, the, the issues are the central, centralized nature of, of ACLs and capability systems where there's one thing and that with capabilities, the systems that we've talked about here, again, people have engineered capability systems in other ways. You don't get a bounded delegation. That, that you know, you, you have that in for reference, you can hand it to anybody and he can hand it on and um, it, it's awfully useful to bound that. So we came up with this straight, the state transition model um, to formalize this. So the, the framework here is there's going to be a world state for each of these systems and what's in the world state is going to depend on the system. There's an action which again corresponds to create and delete, adding and uh, removing rights. Um, so actions transfer, take world states as arguments and produce new world states as their result. And an access judgment given a world state and a request for an access to an object, should that be granted or not. Um, the specification is via labeled transition systems and the analysis is through simulation and by simulation theorems and we'll talk about what those are in a few minutes. So labeled transition systems. Uh, we have a tuple, there's a set of states Q, a set of actions, and a transition relation. So this is very much like finite automata. Um, so that, you know, if from a, you can, from state Q you can transit on A, you can transition to state Q prime, uh, where A is an action, Q and Q prime are states. Um, driving through uh, a map is an example, right, where the, the states are the names of the roads and as the vehicle turns from one road onto another, right, that's taking you through uh, the state space. So I'll start with the model in this formalization of ACLs because it's the simplest, I, I think, to understand. So you have a set of objects, right, by objects we mean the traditional security literature definition of objects, which is to say things like files and um, tape drives, printers, whatever resource it is that you're, you're trying to um, mediate reference to. Um, this, of course, this terminology, of course, since object-oriented programming has become so popular, the overloading of terminology has become somewhat problematic. Um, but I'm in the classical security setting is, 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 what, is how I'm going to use the word object in this talk. R is some set of rights, um, read, write, execute, delete, whatever. Um, we want that set to be fixed, but it's any fixed finite set that is appropriate to the situation you're trying to model. Um, S is the set of subjects and as sort of traditional in the security literature, subjects can also be objects. The, the obvious example of this is a Unix process, right? The ability to kill that process requires an access control decision. It would be very bad if any, ar if any arbitrary user could kill any arbitrary process. So there's an access control decision to be made whether or not one subject can kill another subject. Uh, so, so subjects themselves are the target of access control decisions. So as usual, we'll just make them a subset of the objects. And A here, the, the last element of this tuple, is the set of ACLs, which we model as a map from objects cross rights to the power set of subjects, right? The, the power set being just the set of all subsets of subjects, right? So on this object for, you know, um, to read, file foo, right, might map to Tim and Cynthia. Um, the actions are creating um, new objects, deleting objects and subjects, and adding and removing entries from ACLs. These are the very generic, very obvious things that you would do with this system. Um, so a sample action, uh, the allow to, to add somebody to the ACL 
This semicolon notation is to say that these are the arguments and then this W, you'll, you'll see this in several places in the talk, will represent the world state which is also represented down here as WS. Sorry, it's um, a little hard. So if you're allowing a subject access to an object with, with right R uh, for whatever that, that's going to represent, the set of objects doesn't change from, um, so W here represents O, R, S, and A. The set of rights doesn't change. The subjects, you better do a set union with the subject that we're giving this to to say that this is in fact the subject. Uh, if it had only been referenced in the context of being an object before and these are sets, not multi-sets, so union is idempotent, so it doesn't matter if it's already there. And there's a new ACL map, obviously, defined here as well, okay, it's the the new map should look like the previous map for this object and write and add the subject. Very simple. The access judgment is given a world state, right, one of these four tuples. Extraordinarily simple. That is S in, in the set uh, denoted by O and R, right? Remember that this was a map that came to the power set of subjects, right? So. O a O R is a function that returns a set of subjects. And all we have to do is check whether S is in that set. That's Ackles. Um, capability is rows model. Um, again, the, the objects, rights, subjects, and the capability list, where in this case, the capability list is, is indexed by subject, right, and says all the objects that the subject has access to and the rights on those objects. Um, so again, to grant being the equivalent of allow that we saw uh, in, in the last example, um, again, this passes through and in this case, you just add uh, O and R to the capability list for that subject. Um, and again, we, the, the maps of just flipped around from the previous slide, right? Now it, now the question is OR in the set uh, that's denoted by C of S. So finally, moving on to the reference model, you'll notice that this model is in fact, my claims that capabilities references and capability rows are different, the model has a couple more uh, things in it here. So we have the set of capabilities um, T is sort of the, the set of tickets, it's the valid set of valid capabilities for an object right pair. Um, and wallet, it, W represents the wallet or the, the capability list that a given subject has. Um, so it's going from, um, so, right, a subject has some subset of all the capabilities in the system and that's uh, carried around by the wallet. To pass a capability um, from subject S, capability C to uh, RS, ACK. Am I saying this right? Yes. Um, you move things over. Again, RS needs to be in the subject map um, and the wallet for RS, you just toss the capability in that. Um, so the, and then the access judgment here, is, as you see, is more complicated that something need, the, a ticket needs to be in the subject's capability list and that ticket needs to be valid on that object um, and right combination. So finally to the last model uh, of our version of trust management and as I say this is uh, you know so our take on things is that we're, we're back down to a nice simple four tuple. Uh, A looks like the ACL map that we had before. Um, 
so it, these are attached to the objects to say who directly has access to them. Um, so here it, it's ACL, let's see, right, ACK. OJ. Uh, ACL action and write to the power set of objects and names. And then there's also this DMAP for delegating. So that if I have a right, I can delegate it to someone else. Um, so it's an, it's an object and a right, um, followed object, right, and who you wish to send it to. Um, and, let's, and that goes to the objects cross names. Why? How did names end up in here? Uh, the, so again, the, the actions look just like the ACL actions, except there's now delegate to hand it off and to revoke a delegation. Um, and so, okay, um, adding somebody to the ACL list looks very similar to how we saw it before in the ACLs, except you notice this D parameter. This is the depth to which they can further delegate it. So I can delegate, you know, reading file foo to Tim with depth zero, and then Tim can read it, but he can't pass it on. And I can delegate to Cynthia the ability to read file bar with delegation depth two. So she could then pass that on to Tim with delegation, and when she passes it on, the delegation depth, of course, decreases. So Tim can read it with delegation depth one, so he can go on to uh, more, more of the students. Um, so I trust the equations here are reasonably self-explanatory. If you've been keeping up with all of this, um, they look just the same. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually slow down here. So the ACL and delegation maps we have as predicates for ACLs, right? It's a subject, an object, a right, and a delegation depth. Um, for delegation, it's a subject, an object, the right, the receiving subject, and the depth on which it can be delegated further to. And th these are what those maps when, when you press them down to. And so the access judgment, the S can read some file foo, whatever. If access is true for some delegation depth D, D greater than or equal to zero, uh, under the closure of the following four rules, which we can explain as if you are on the ACL, you can access the object. Uh, if you're on the ACL with the appropriate right, you get access to the object. That's exactly what we wanted. If you can derive access, so if starting from there, if you have a delegation certificate of depth D minus one, and you can derive access from depth D, and eventually this of course has to terminate up on this rule because that's the only initial way of driving it. And so, right, if A has access to B, if A is given, if A has access to B on right with right R, and A has delegated that access to, if Alice has delegated to Charlie the access to Bob with right R at one less level than she had access to it herself, that's fine, and that get, means Charlie gets access to Bob again at, at the lower delegation depth, right? Char Charlie's ability to delegate has been bounded. Um, and then there are these two last rules that say, um, quite simply, if you have access, if from these two rules you can derive access with a greater delegation depth than the one that you actually need, right? It, it, if you have, 
If you are doing the access yourself and have not delegated on farther, but you have the ability to, you can bump that then equivalent to having access with the ability to delegate it fewer times. And the same rule for delegation. So, so a few notes on simulation. So that's our basic take on trust management, on, on, how, how, on what the core authorization framework for trust management looks like. We have not done things like add K of N sort of policies, although I believe that you can fit those into this general framework uh, in a, quite cleanly. So now that we've done all this formal rigorous hand waving and everybody in the room is hopefully not in a state of rigor mortis, um, how do we compare these things, right? right? We, we've gone to all this work and done all this math to, to set these things up and now, now, now let's actually uh, learn something. So the technique is simulations and bi-simulations. I'm not going to go into the ultra formal definitions here. Uh, you don't really need them. The key thing is that P can simulate Q if P can, if any time Q makes a move in, through an automata, P can make a corresponding move. And P and Q are bisimilar if they can each simulate the other. And just a small technical note, the simulation relation has to be the same. You don't get to pick separate simulation relations. You need the same uh, relation. And there are two kinds of bisimilarity that we're going to see. What we're going to call strong bisimulation. One step in the first automata is simulated by exactly one step in the second automata. Now weak bisimulation, it's a one to many. Right? One, one automata making one step may require the second automata to make two steps uh, through. And that actually turns out to be interesting from a systems point of view. Uh, that we'll come to later on. So the proof technique here is to consider these systems as label transition systems um, and, deri and derive whether or not there are simulation relations between the two. Um, as I just said, there, there's the one-to-one -one versus the one-to-many and the strong versus weak distinction. And one of the things that to, to capture formally um, this idea that th this last one can be rephrased. The, the, the simulation relations need to be independent of state or another almost equivalent, but not quite, but perhaps more intuitively useful is to say that these simulation relations can only do constant work. Uh, I.e., the, the point here is to say that the, 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 this is, this is the technical gut show on which we will hang um, the revocation difficulties of capabilities, right? Is to say that no, you, you just get, you don't get to, when you write down what the simulation relation between the two systems is, you don't get to look at the state of the system. You have to give one simulation that works independently of what specific state these systems are in. Um, and then you pull a counting argument that, that will show that no simulations exist. So the results are that apples and capabilities as rows of, of the access matrix are equivalent. That is to say, they're strongly bisimilar. For each action that you take in the apple model, there is a corresponding action in capabilities as rows. Thank heavens this is true because as we've seen, they're just different views of the same data structure. If that weren't true, I shouldn't be here. Um, the, the fact that that's true, I, I mean, the, the, as I said, this is what, completely what we expected and, and it tells us that, that our models are hopefully at least somewhat meaningful. Um, I, I mean, they preserve something that, that we certainly expected to be preserved. So reference capabilities are not equivalent to ACLs, but ACLs are weakly similar to references. Um, Again, this is, so the difficulty here, of course, is the revocation action that uh, you can't get. And trust management lands in the middle. So if a picture is a thousand words, um, capability, ACLs and rows are equivalent, right? I mean, this could be one point. 
Um, ACLs are weakly equivalent to capabilities as references, but not the converse. The arrow means that the one can do anything the other one can do, roughly? Yes. In that direction? Right. In that direction. Um, the capability as rows, um, right, the, the trust management system can do anything that capability as rows can. I mean, the, the obvious one, of course, is that, but that's not in the diagram because the, these arrows compose in the, right, so, yeah, right, by transitivity, you, 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 you get that, but you can't go down this way because the trust management has the bounded delegation depth that you did not get in capabilities as rows. Weak. Sorry. Uh, so, as we said, this all gets to be this tension between delegation and revocation. Ackles, you just didn't get any delegation ability at all, which makes administering the system a royal pain. But you want to revoke somebody, it's really trivial. You know exactly where to look in the model. You know, it, you just go to that ACL, you edit it, and you're done. Capabilities as tickets give you trivial delegation. You can hand out tickets to all of your best friends, but boy, it's really hard uh, if you decide that something went wrong and you need to get all those tickets back. Um, so the result of this was that trust management strongly from knuckles and row capabilities, but neither are equivalent. Um, again, it's strongly similar to references, but not the other way around. So the idea is sort of that th there are two things, there are a couple of key things going on here. One is that with delegation depth, things can't go, if, if you set the delegation depth to some finite number, things can't propagate infinitely far. The other is that if you want to, you have some amount of selectivity in your revocation. Because if you take somebody off the ACL, you've automatically killed all the delegation paths that go through that person at the root. It's not completely selective revocation as, as you had with just ACLs. But you can't, if, if, you know, if we decide, sorry my host, but you know, the, the commander just comes down and uh, the, decides that you've done something bad and Tim, you're gone. It's very easy to set up the system so that all, all, you know, when Tim's students got access because Tim had delegated it to them, they lose. But all of Cynthia's students, and she's still on the faculty, re keep their access. And, and, and so, so you have, it's not entirely selective, but that, that seems to be a very useful middle ground. I can't tell you what's already, remember this is discretionary and what's already happened in the past is what's already happened in the past. So in a, f a few more pictures um, to show us, oh, the same picture back. So that's our take on authorization. And we don't really suggest that you do things without naming. That would be a bad idea. But nonetheless, we think it's very interesting to look at that because we can then compose naming on top of those results and that will be the rest of the talk. So are there any questions I can take quickly? Okay, if I'll push, let me push on. Um, so, so far, We've seen, we, we've done the entire set of spooking like things like keys are principles. And that was literally true in the work I just talked about. There were no names for anything. Um, but names are incredibly important um, for several reasons. One, people think in terms of names, right? If you had to write policies in terms of keys, you'd never write your security policy down. It, it would just be way too painful. Secondly, accountability generally ends up having to get linked back to the real world, which again is names. I mean, if a key misbehaves, what are you going to do? Throw it in crypto jail? What is crypto jail? And last but by no means least, keys change over time. 
They expire. They get revoked. There is no way, and when that, that is going to happen, I, I mean, th these are both facts of life. And you need to engineer your system to cope with them. So you want to be writing at some level of abstraction, not keys, so that you don't have to entirely rewrite your policy every time somebody loses a key. Um, <laughs> so you, you want somewhere. So keys, the important thing for the purposes of this talk is that they're globally unique. And they're, they're just unique bit strings. We assume the usual axioms about them. For names, there are a couple things we want to have. One, one is global names, like DNS, bang, bang, and, and sudsy speak, right? Names that everybody agrees on what the definition of. And then there are local names. Um, it, again, in, in, in Sudsy, this is Alice's Bob's Charlie, right, where, where you can link the names together. So we're, we use a dotted notation for that, like internet domain names, except the ordering is left to right instead of right to left. Uh, we assume global names and local names are disjoint. Keys and names are disjoint. Um, so the meaning of a name is something we're going to call a name object. I'm, I'm just going to invent the semantic object out of my hat. Uh, and this is, the this is where we get the level of abstraction that we want. So the idea is that you can send a name object a self message and get back a key, the, the, the public key that goes with that name object. And if there's a name definition for linked names, uh, you just push, push on to that. So these name objects, in essence, you, you could think implementation-wise of them being sort of like pointers. I mean, they might be URLs. They're, you know, they're somewhere where you can go to ask somebody what their key is. Principles are either name objects, role objects, which we won't define formally, or keys. There's this question about groups and roles and how they interact. And I think we found a very, I, uh, there's a very nice answer here, I think. Groups are immutable. Groups are the set of people who attended this talk. That's never going to change in the future, right? The, for, in an access control policy, the set of people who are at this talk should be able to check the videotape out of the library or watch the online streaming version, right? Um, Roles are mutable groups. Roles are when you want, for example, to specify that your administrative assistant can book plane tickets for you, or it can book your travel. The point is, I, I want to say that my administrator can do that for me without necessarily specifying exactly who that administrator is because that's going to change. We, we know that's going to change, right? In the corporate America, right, the CEO can do most but not quite everything, right? It doesn't matter who the CEO is. By virtue of being CEO, he has the right to, you know, perhaps go read everybody's files, except he can't alter the accounting records and uh, a few things like that. You have the obvious military uh, analogs to these cases, right, where you have people sliding through the enterprise and changing what their organizations are, but there are rights and privileges that go with being in that position, not, it doesn't really matter who is holding that position by virtue of being in that position, they're there. And those change, so we think that both of these are important. And I think this is a very nice distinction to gather um, to, 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 to explain what, what the real difference is. Most of the time, you want roles, but not always, right? The example, if I can be slightly hypothetical, again, if you have an administrative assistant or anybody who reports to you, you know, dear so, you know, dear so and so, congratulations, you've had an excellent year, you get a 10% raise, signed whoever. That, that's a nice memo to send out. But if your administrator changes next year, you really want the permissions on that letter tied to the person you sent it to, not tied to the position, because you really don't want whoever is in that position next year to learn that last year's person got a 10% raise, and you know budgets are tight this year, 
And even though this person did a better job, you can only give them 7% right and you don't want their feelings getting hurt. So there are, both of these situations occur in modeling and it's um, important to take care of them. Quick question, is that distinction consistent with the Arbok dogma? Uh, I, I believe it, as, as far, I'm going to oversimplify Arbac. Um, I, I, I think the, in my mind, the central contribution of RBAC is this level of indirection. Is to say that lots of things happen because of your position organizationally in the enterprise. And it doesn't matter who you are. We want this, it, I mean, right, how do you solve all problems in computer science? You add a level of indirection. This has been known for 30 or 40 years. And I see the central contribution of RBAC as being applied to that. But there seems to be a lot of confusion of what are groups, what are roles, what are the differences. This is our proposal for what the differences are and why you want both. Um, so the world state in this model with naming is going to be just the world state that we saw for trust management before uh, with the objects, rights, ACL, and delegation maps. Um, the actions are basically the same except if a subject S wants to add something with names, the, the meaning of doing this is that if S utters NS, well that's really go to his name object and look up the key of NS, right? And that's the real subject that we're adding to the ACL. Um, I, if we're translating it from, from the world of names to the world of keys, that's the right subject to be adding. That goes, and similarly for delegation, the delegation statements of course need, need to essentially be signed, right? We need to say who is, so if S says delegate um, his right on uh, object S to, to the person N or to, to the principal N uh, with depth D, then okay, S is saying that uh, right object, look up who S means when they utter the name ND uh, by looking in their namespace, right, which is just going to map the name to another name object um, with the depth. Now, the, the access judgments look basically the same as before and we push, what we've done here is taken the judgments that we saw before and pushed the names through them, push the name objects through them to, to, to summarize. And so the delegation rules work, so the ACL rule works just the same as before except now it's expressed in terms of names. The delegation rule again, it's the same proof rule and we have these two rules for handling the fact that if, if you do something with greater depth than is required you can go down to it. So we've just shove the names through there. The interesting theorem is that as long as the mappings between names and keys are not changing, if you combine the proof rule, the access judgment I gave you before with the one I just gave you as a rewrite system, they're confluent. The upshot of this is to say, so confluent says that if you start from the same place, even if, even, if you do the, even if you map names to keys in different orders, wherever you get to, you, you go to it, there, there's a common place that you can get to again. So basically it says the, the answer of the access judgment will be the same no matter what, no matter what order you evaluate things in. Uh, as far as I know, nobody else has a result similar to this. Uh, the the Sudsy Spooky, this still appears to be an open question. Um, and there's a proof of soundness to say that given the access judgment that I present, given these access rules, if these find a proof, if these drive access, then the semantic model, all the set, all the set funging that we did supports uh, access being granted. So j just the logical soundness. Conjecture. 
at the moment is that th those rules are complete. We are working on the proof of the theorem uh, right now. I, um, I had hoped to have this uh, done, but it's taken a little longer, right? So completeness is to say that anything that the semantic model, anything that all that set manipulation that we specified supports as, as a valid access, you can prove it using those four rules that uh, we saw earlier. So to wrap up, um, trust, man trust management as I've presented it here and there are other interpretations of that buzzword and they're equally valid. Uh, gives you quick but not entirely selective revocation. Um, and to some degree this depends on how much freshness checking you're doing of, along the various certificates. Revocation and delegation tug at each other in general and that's been a folk theorem and now we have a formal statement of it. Um, the weak versus strong simulation relations show up in the atomicity of your implementation. So that if you have two things in here which are weakly equivalent in the sort of destination tomta where you're doing multiple steps, if you really want that to be equivalent to where you, the specification you started with, you'd better make sure that you lock the system so that that intermediate state is not visible to an application. Uh, so so the, the fact that a lot of those relationships were weak equivalents is, is quite important. Um, the framework and proof techniques we're using, I mean, we applied them to four different systems and we got uh, basically the results we both expected and wanted. Uh, so it seems like it's a fairly useful uh, set of formal techniques to be using. Um, and then the final results we're getting is to say that our hypothesis going into this work was that we could in fact decompose naming and authorization and that you could have this, in essence, compilation from names down to keys and that the system, that the uh, two systems would compose well and the confluence and soundness results uh, give us that. So um, that's what I had to say and I'd be happy to take